Conference Committee report on House File Number 2292, uh, an act relating to early childhood. The report is ad addressed to the Honorable Melissa Hortman, Speaker of the House, and the Honorable Bobby Joe Champion, President of the Senate. We, the underside conferees for House File Number 2292, report that we have agreed upon the items dispute and recommend as follows. The report is signed by two of the three members on the part of the House and two of the three members on the part of the Senate. Pinto moves that the report of the Conference Committee on House File Number 2292 be adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Conference Committee. I recognize the author, the member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto, who will explain the report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, thanks for the willingness to, uh, to take this up um, right away. Um, we uh, had had a discussion about uh, this report uh, a little bit uh, over the weekend, and uh, it is coming back on the same form, though we did have a chance to consider some proposals uh, from, um, from Representative Daniels and had a good conversation uh, about them. Um, and members, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is the early learning budget bill coming out of the uh, Children and Families Committee in the House. Um, we are uh, quite excited about the different provisions in it, uh, and perhaps uh, I'll simply note, as I say, um, that there were ch no changes from what, what was discussed earlier, and I'll present more regarding the substance uh, as we discuss uh, debate final passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any further discussion on the conference committee report? I recognize the member from Rice, Representative Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, Chair Pinto, for uh, uh, having us persuade you to open up the committee report and uh, follow the procedures and have an open meeting uh, for the public. Um, I wish I would have got one of my six amendments passed this morning, but I understand. Um, I think uh, having more money for the Metro Deaf School would have been a nice thing. We tried a couple amendments to do that. Uh, we can maybe come back and talk about that later. Uh, but uh, thank you for allowing us to do that. and. Uh, Thank you for all the discussion we had on both uh, Friday night and Saturday morning. Uh, I got a little flushed. I was getting a little embarrassed about all the nice things people are saying about, about uh, Representative Daniels. But, uh, um, you know, maybe, maybe that was the right thing at the right time to make sure that the rest of the session goes as it should, following the process, following the rules, following the Constitution. So um, thank you for allowing us to do it the right way. And uh, with that, I just appreciate it. The committee was a lot of work, um, some good stuff, some stuff I maybe didn't agree with, but um, I guess my, if you're looking for a recommendation from me, I would probably vote no on the bill. Uh, there's some things that I don't, uh, I think we could have done a lot better, um, but you have to vote your district. So uh, with that, um, thank you, and uh, we'll uh, see how the, the vote goes. Thank you. There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to adopt the conference committee report on House File 2292, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by conference. Third reading, House File number 2292 as amended by conference. Third reading as amended by conference. Discussion. I recognize the member from Morrison, Representative Tricia. Thank you, members, um, and thank you for having this bill in front of us. One of the things that I'd just like to bring up, in looking at the two items, and there's a number of items in here that span all across the early childhood area, but one item in particular that caught my attention was the $200,000 uh, for the Minnesota Charter School for the Deaf, and then $250,000 that goes into the base for the Reach Out and Read. What's interesting about that is I think the priorities are flipped. And I actually looked at the financials for the Reach Out and Read, and it's a great nonprofit. They've been around since 1997, and they've been getting all sorts of um, funding from different areas, including one of them is MDE. MDE gives them 75000 So they already have the support. What I find is interesting is that we put in the base for Reach Out and Read 250000 each year, but only a one-time funding for Metro School of Deaf. So I went out and I looked at this, and I hope, members, that you go out and take a look at the Charter Metro School for Deaf. They do a fantastic job. And I'm actually gonna, since we're not gonna change this, I'm gonna make this a plug for them. 
And if you go look at the, the donations, the number one donation right now is I, my wife and I put $100 into them with their GoFundMe account. They're actually trying to raise money for facilities and is, uh, issues that they have going on. And I will take this as an opportunity. If, if you're not going to put it in the fu funding in the base, if you're not going to flip that, go out and use the, the money that you have and donate to their cause. They're trying to raise $15,000 for a gym. They have an amazing staff ratio. It's an amazing school. And this is one of the schools that we look at that's doing it all right. And they're doing it from a grassroots, organic effort. They're not here begging us for things. They're not making demands. They're just saying, hey, we can do this, and a little bit of help would be nice once in a while. So rather than putting them in the base, which is what we should have done, we're giving them one-time funding. And God bless them for just saying thank you and moving on, but go look at their webpage. The first thing you're going to be reading with is a GoFundMe account for $14,000 to put a gym on. 14000 folks, we could have found that. I wish I would have known about that project sooner, but uh, I didn't get it to here. So what I'd like to say is take this as an opportunity to go help the Metro School for the Deaf. I wish they would have been the ones getting the base funding instead of the other way around. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to do good work despite of what's in front of us. So uh, take an opportunity to go donate to them. I'm sure they would appreciate it. Further discussion, I recognize Representative Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, and I just wanted to, again, talk about um, why I believe this bill falls short. Um, I, from Greater Minnesota, one of our biggest issues is childcare. And we talk about how this is really the cornerstone of how we're able to find, um, we need to have people to be able to go back to work. And, and uh, in order to do that is having to make sure that people can take care of their children. And um, in, uh, in, in Moore County, we have just a, a crisis of lack of options for childcare. Everything's very expensive and there's lots of, and there's, uh, we've seen over the last uh, couple years, even with the stabilization funding, that um, our childcare options have been closing. And unfortunately, I don't believe this bill will be very helpful. I've read from before the recommendations from the 2019 task force, and, and I would just like to remind that in there it talked about the importance that we have to actually look at what the task force has asked us to do, where they talk about how the loss of thousands of licensed family care providers over the last decade is predominantly due to burdensome regulations, licensing inconsistencies, and increased paperwork. This bill doesn't address that. It describes that we should replace a licensing framework with a risk-based violation system. In this type of system, licensing standards are categorized by upon the risk of harm that violation would have. And there are tiers of enforcement mechanisms. They actually tell the legislation to um, for a full and abbreviated license review based on statistically significant key indicators and to develop a risk-based data-driven tiered violation system. This bill doesn't address any of that. And what we have talked about over and over in my area is the fact that we need to have, um, we need to be removing barriers to have a more consistent, more um, streamlined uh, inspection and licensing system. And again, this bill doesn't address that. Something I'm probably the um, most concerned about is something that's on um, page 17, and it, uh, where it talks about tiered scholarships based on varying circumstances. And um, when I read the language of the bill, it actually says the varying circumstance of a family income, geographic location, and that makes me question wh what does that even, what does it even mean? Um, how, how does that, how is that going to be distributed knowing that my geographic location is about 15 minutes away from the Iowa border. And so that makes me concerned about what, what, that, uh, what a tiered scholarship is going to be. And then uh, the next paragraph down on seven, in 1720, starting in 1726, it talks about that uh, a, a program that has a four-star uh, rating from the parent aware system this is just another, again, while it may seem like it's, uh, this is us to hold high standards, especially up in the cities, this is another area in my 
in, in greater Minnesota, in Soda, that seems to be more of a barrier rather than uh, rather than anything else. Our our child care, family child care systems, um, they go by word of mouth. You don't you're not successful if you're if and you won't get more clients if you're not successful in doing what you need to do. And it's so much money and so much paperwork and so much time to become parent aware, especially the four or five star rating, that very few of my of my family child care providers actually find it worth going through. And then finally, I did want to kind of piggyback on what uh, Representative Krisha talked about in uh, on page 25 with a reach out and read. I find it really interesting interesting that in education, I'm trying to get my computer to do what I want it to do here. Um, I find it very interesting in education that uh, we have worked so hard to get the READ Act passed. And while I still have significant concerns about the specific language of it, the goal of it is important and we see why it's necessary because of our um, because of our poor literacy rates here in Minnesota especially. And I spent the weekend going back and listening to the Emily Hanford Selling a Story and all of those things, uh, the podcast. And one of the things that it was emphasized over and over again was this idea that if we had literacy rich environments that our kids were gonna be able to read. So we're really talking out of both sides of our mouths. And if you look here, 2515, 25, uh, it says that we're going to give $250,000 both in 24 and 25 to create a, a, this reach out and read, which again, I'm not discounting their intentions or their passion, but we are going to encourage childhood development through a network of healthcare clinics, fine, to create a literacy rich environment. We're literally giving millions of dollars in E12 to say that the literacy-rich environment is not an effective method to increase our literacy scores, and yet now we're going to be giving $250,000 in what, per, per, in who knows how long, to work against what we're already trying to say that we shouldn't be doing. Whole language, balanced literacy does not work. And I was told over and over again that the READ Act is going to be something that's going to be transformational, and that's where we're putting millions of dollars into it, and now we're putting all this money into something that counterbalances that and actually disproves, says that this is not something that is actually even proven through science. Tell me again, members, why we are prioritizing money in something that we have already said that we're going to work against in our E12 bill. If we're going to prioritize money, and because apparently money is supposed to fix everything, if we're going to prioritize money and create a literacy-rich environment, when it's already been disproven that that is something that is actually going to raise our literacy scores, maybe we can find money to actually put towards Metro Death, like what we talked about from Representative Creshaw. Let's not be working against ourselves, members. And so at this point, um, you know, with the fact that this does not actually take away barriers, it creates more barriers for my family child care providers, it's working against the science of reading, members, I would recommend a no vote. Further discussion, I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Katiza Watoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I have been the sponsor for the Reach Out and Read bills over the past three biennium. In 2019, we funded it. It was not, um, did not receive base funding. Last biennium, it did not receive funding through the legislature, but the governor's office appropriated some funding from uh, the federal funding throughout COVID. And um, I just wanna give people a little bit more background information because it sounds like there's maybe some confusion on what this program does. So Reach Out and Read is a federal organization. They have presences in um, all the states and they work directly with pediatric clinics um, 
in order to make sure that children have exposure to books at age appropriate, um, uh, culturally relevant, home language books. And um, what the money did in 2019 was help them expand throughout greater Minnesota. They're still working on this. And this is a program, you know, they, there's staff on the ground, they help them put this program into place. So they cover the first, you know, they say, you provide the doctors, we'll throw in the books for free. And they help them get the books for the first year of the program, and then they work directly with that clinic in order to help them find localized funding, because then it, it can continue on without state funding. And the, the, the dramatic information that we have based on the children who reach age five and begin kindergarten um, with this million word gap, if they don't have exposure on a daily basis, if their parents, um, you know, potentially are illiterate that, you know, or functionally illiterate, many adults don't read a book after they graduate from high school or college, which is very unfortunate. Um, but this million word gap causes additional um, lack and um, contributes to the opportunity gap that we have ongoing here in our Minnesota schools. So this program helps kids have access to these books, have, um, helps their parents um, begin a home library if they don't have the funds in order to do so. And it's a, it's a tremendous program that is working with children all across the state of Minnesota. Um, and I'm proud to be the author of it. I would uh, appreciate a green vote. Further discussion, I recognize the member from Wright, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just wanna toss in some last comments here regarding the overall philosophy of early childhood education and how it's been approached this session. Um, as one of the two committees I served on this session, um, this, like the Public Safety Committee, was very educational um, and expose me to ideas and concepts that I otherwise would not have been exposed to, and so I'm grateful for that. Um, one of the ideas that stuck out from the very first meeting, our very first presentation that we heard, um, was this notion that we expect the most of parents when they have the least. I thought that was a compelling slogan and truth. We expect the most when they have the least. But I spent a lot of time thinking about that and trying to, because sometimes words that sound pithy um, don't really carry the substance that I think we assume are attached to them. Um, when has that ever not been the case throughout the entirety of human history? When has it ever been the case that people have not had to start from zero? Um, we, we always have to build up from the beginning to become whatever it is that we ultimately become um, and accumulate whatever it is that we ultimately accumulate. And we have mechanisms in society in order to try to, to borrow from the future, to pull back to where we're at in order to enable us to have a better quality of life. A mortgage comes to mind as an example um, where we're saying based upon our capacity to earn, to produce value and to earn in the future, we're, we're going to pull some of that from the future to now so that we can enjoy some of the benefit today in, in the form of having a home, having a place to live. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to translate that concept to the idea of early childhood education. I think there, it's worth asking that question and putting some thought into it of, are there other existing models to, to kind of not necessarily copy and paste from, but be inspired by and come up with some way to do this that ensures that it's sustainable, because that's really my number one concern here, um, is that we're, we're starting something with early childhood education, and not just there, in a, in a lot of different aspects and jurisdiction of, of policy that's being tackled this session. We're saying yes to the beginning of several things without knowing that we're gonna be able to persist and sustain those things going forward into the future. Um, and, you know, I think uh, an analogy that I think helps us see the problem here, um, potentially, and it might be a little crude because it just popped into my head this morning, so bear with me. But, you know, when the waitress comes to you at the end of your meal at the restaurant and she asks you if you want another drink, if you want dessert, 
Um, we all recognize that the question is framed in such a way that it's easy to say, yes, do I want another drink? Sure. Do I want dessert? Yes, that sounds fantastic. But what you're really being asked is, would you like your bill to be 30 or $40 more when I bring it to you in about 20 minutes? And we know that, which is why very frequently our answer is no, we do not want whatever it is that you're offering me. Um, and I feel as though a lot of the things that we talk about in this complex on this campus, whether it's in committee or here on the floor, are often presented in those ways. Would you like to have free college for anyone making under $80,000 a year? Would you like to have help with early childhood education? Would you like to have paid family medical leave? It's easy to answer yes to all of those things if you're not counting the cost of the bill that's going to be presented to you down the line. Um, and certainly we recognize that all of these things, anything that has value has to be produced. That value has to come from somewhere. And in, the, in state government, in our state budget, that value comes from income taxes and sales taxes primarily. And that's revenue that people have to generate. They have to go out and they have to work in order to make it happen. And I find it interesting that, you know, when we talk about paid family medical leave, um, the argument was made that people need to be able to leave the workplace in order, in order to go take care of their family. But then when we talk about early childhood edu education, we're flipping that argument completely upside down and saying we need to take people out of the home so that they can go somewhere to build a widget. And what's missing in the calculation in either of those arguments is that where, wherever the value is coming from, somebody is producing it. And so in the form of, again, in the form of a mortgage, you're borrowing from your own productivity in the future in order to fund something that is of benefit to you now. When it comes to these programs that we're putting forward this session, we're not taking out a mortgage on our production, our future production. We're taking out a mortgage on the production of future taxpayers, current and future taxpayers. And the problem with that is that they have a choice about whether or not they're going to uphold that end of the bargain. They can pick up and they can move, they can go to another state. And enough of them do that, and we're gonna have serious problems down the road. I'm deeply concerned that we're gonna be looking at a deficit in very, very short order in the state of Minnesota. That's why I'm gonna be a no vote on this. Thank you. Further discussion to the repassage of House File 2292 as amended by conference. I recognize the member from Rice, Representative Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members, for the, the robust discussion both Friday night, Saturday morning, and, and uh, today. Um, Representative Hudson, you just, that was a fantastic analogy. They, in one area, they want to have people stay home and take care of their kids, and the other one, they want to make sure they can have daycare so they can go do their job. So I'm not sure which one it is, but that was a spot-on analogy. Thank you for that. Um, the overall bill has a few problems in it. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, uh, just very few. Um, uh, Representative Krishnaw talked about the deaf school. I thought that uh, was a, a great um, analogy, is we should be putting money to that. And I, I did discuss, discuss in the committee meeting this morning that um, We'd really like to put more money into the deaf school. They have 100000 a year for two years, and then they have to come back to the legislature and ask for more. Um, one thing that kind of alarmed me a little bit was the, uh, the uh, language about uh, being a licensed teacher in, in, in uh, some of the daycares. That they, there again, we always wanted local control, but now we're taking that local control away from them. Um, just there's a handful of items in there that, that uh, are good. There's a handful that are, are bad and will um, really put pressure on our uh, family-owned daycare centers. Um, we've already lost around 700 uh, daycare providers that are family-owned. And this will just uh, accelerate that number, I'm afraid, if this bill passes as is. But um, I've made most of my comments. Uh, my, my fellow uh, members have made really good comments, and I'm not a, a great speech uh, person, so I will leave it at that. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you for uh, allowing us to reconvene uh, the committee report uh, this morning and, and uh, getting some amendments offered. 
Uh, I think we're better if we we're all better if we follow the process, follow follow the rules, and follow the state constitution. So, uh, thank you, members. And with that, I vote. I recommend a no vote. Further discussion on the repassage of House File 2292 is admitted by conference. I recognize the member from Stearns, the Minority Leader, Representative Damith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, Friday and, and Saturday, um, we had a, an important debate about why this conference committee report needed to go back to the conference committee for further consideration of the amendments that our lead, Representative Daniels, wanted to offer. And I do appreciate the majority finally agreeing to that request to send this back to conference committee through a more open process. And I believe that Minnesotans are looking for a transparent and open process. I am disappointed that none of the reasonable amendments that were offered by Representative Daniels were adopted into the final bill that is before us. But before we actually vote on the passage of HF 2292, I want to just briefly touch on the suggested changes to the bill that we would have liked to have seen that would have garnered our support. First, we want to make sure that, the in, that we would protect the integrity of the Early Learning Scholarship Program. This program has a proven track record of success in empowering parents without being shrouded in the fog of fraud that has undermined public confidence in the Child Care Assistance Program. Our Republican caucus has long supported the Early Learning Scholarship Program since we first started funding it back in 2011. So it is concerning that the dramatic changes being proposed in this bill will have unintended or potentially harmful consequences to not only the integrity of the program, but the full and fair participation of child care providers. So to fix these problems, Representative Daniels offered several amendments. Representative Daniels offered an amendment to keep the Early Learning Scholarship Program separate from yet another new program called the Great Start Scholarship Program. According to the author of this proposal, the program would take the best parts of the Early Learning Scholarships and the best parts of CCAP. We can assume that the author intends to exclude the CCAP fraud from the new program. However, there is no reason to hijack this successful, proven program to give a newly created commissioner at a newly created state agency something to do. Unfortunately, this amendment was rejected, and the program that we support will simply be swallowed up. This bill gives the Minnesota Department of Education authority to exclude four-year-olds from the Early Learning Scholarship Program. This will have a negative impact on our child care providers for the sole purpose of expanding school-based pre-kindergarten programs. Representative Daniels offered an amendment to fix that. Unfortunately, this amendment was rejected and this new policy will push four-year-olds out of the Early Learning Scholarship Program. And Representative Daniels offered an amendment to restore the current language requiring the Commissioner of Education to set a target scholarship amount based on the child care market rate survey. If this law is followed properly, this assures the scholarship value is aligned to the costs of child care. The new language in this bill allows MDE to create a tiered scholarship program based on factors such as provider circumstances and geographic region. Under this provision, the commissioner will set lower scholarship amounts for family child care providers in greater Minnesota, while setting higher funding levels for school-based or chain-based child care centers. Unfortunately, this amendment was rejected and this policy will lead to fewer opportunities for the fair participation of family child care providers in the scholarship program. The second thing I want to talk about is priorities. As we have heard in this chamber, priorities matter, and you fund what you value. Representative Daniels offered an amendment true to his own heart and personal experience. 
He wanted to fully fund Metro Deaf Charter School's request to serve young children who have a primary disability of deaf, deaf blind, or hard of hearing. This bill provides deaf, Metro Deaf with only $200,000 for fiscal year 24 and 25, while providing $500,000 for the Reach Out and Read nonprofit, including $250,000 per year in base funding for the nonprofit. So this means, with the Green Vote members, that you will be subsidizing doctors to buy books for their waiting rooms while young deaf children will have to come back to the legislature in two years to actually beg for more funding, and that is wrong. We should fully fund Metro Deaf's request to serve young children with disabilities rather than giving nonprofits an unlimited line of credit. Let's fund the kids and let the doctors come back in two years to prove the value of their program. Believe it or not, this amendment, too, was rejected. And in two years, while nonprofits will have guaranteed funding, the children at Metro Deaf will wait and hope their program receives continued funding. Members, we had a real opportunity to build bipartisan support for this bill that had the potential to make a real investment in and maintain the integrity of the Early Learning Scholarship Program. Unfortunately, the majority is choosing to hijack and begin a slow dismantling of the early learning scholarships to create a new program under a brand new massive bureaucracy under the leadership of another political appointee. But worse, you are actually, with that green vote, putting nonprofits before children with disabilities. This simply betrays a lack of clear priorities where kids come first, especially children with disabilities. Members, I believe we can and we should do better. Further discussion, I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Perez Vega. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to everyone who spent extra time this morning to uh, reevaluate and go over through this excellent, wonderful bill. Um, it's been an honor. Once again, I want to tip my hat here to uh, our chair, Dave Pinto, Representative Dave Pinto. We are here for all of our Minnesota children. I've worked on this great bill in my first legislative session as a freshwoman here, and I've learned so much, not just from Chair Pinto, but from our staff, our nonpartisan staff that have gone through every step, and also every member in this committee who gave a part and a voice into this, whether they feel they were a part of it or not. Um, being a child that learned through music, not only literacy, but mathematics, it's an honor to see learning with music here for all of our Minnesota youth to have that opportunity and schools to have the accessibility for our early learners to learn about each other through rhythm and harmony. And I hope that we can grow together in this chamber more through rhythm and harmony by learning from each other. And that's how I learned in this great state of Minnesota, culture, language, accessibility, and even little songs about law like I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. We could learn just by having that accessibility to creativity and artwork at an early age. In connection to financial literacy, what we talk about our children are gonna be born to have saving accounts. And this is something that we're gonna fight for more because this is just one kick down the road for accessibility for all Minnesotans to have what our children in the district that I represent of St. Paul have when they're born. They have a savings account. Not only will they learn about financial literacy, but some of their parents, when I think about those teen parents that I teach in after school programming in the St. Paul Public School District who benefited this when they had their child and they were scared because they didn't know how to even open up a bank account, but the city and organizations like Youth Prize are there at accessibility to teach, and now those kids are graduating college and, 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 and learning how to open up their own accounts while their child is entering programs into pre-K that now will have accessibility funding. We're not taking away things. 
We're giving it to where we know works. Because we are the children that have grown into parents to see that these are ways that they've worked and we don't have to be struggling to find accessibility into spaces like this. Chair Pinto, we've been patient. Our committees have been patient from not only the House, but I want to give a shout out to another mentor, Senator Kunish, who had advocated and also went through some differences in the challenges that we had on this side of the aisle and came to an understanding that we can learn and we can grow together. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to learn and grow together for who? For our kids, for our family, and for a better education system. So thank you, and I urge vote green. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you, Representative Perez-Vega, for your work. Uh, Representative Daniels and the other members of, uh, of the committee, I'm, I'm grateful to, the, um, to our partners, as uh, uh, Chair Kunish, as uh, Representative Perez-Vega said, uh, for hard work, and to our staff, uh, Annie Mock and Sylvie Beckel and nonpartisan, uh, Molly Peterson and Jody Withers, our partisan staff, and my committee administrator, um, Coley Colburn, uh, and Zara Khan, the committee legislative assistant, um, as well for their work. Um, members, uh, I'm going to go through a few of the points uh, made. Um, if I get a little bit um, salty at a couple points more than I usually do, um, we did have the four hours on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, uh, so uh, I'm just going to kind of go backwards through the bill. Uh, if you want to follow along on page 26, the Metro Def. Um, Leader Damoth made a comment about uh, how, you know, your, how the proposal from uh, Representative Daniels to expand funding for that group would fully fund it. No, it would overfund it. As I explained to committee today uh, and had a conversation with Lee Daniels afterwards, had a lot of talk with Metro Def. They had a proposal that was not going to work. I worked with them very carefully. They said, we would like to have $100,000 in the one year, $100,000 the second year, one-time funding. The amendment would have overfunded. Not something I usually hear from that side of the aisle, interested in overfunding. That's not the choice. Uh, what we're doing is we're fully funding the request at the expense of, in one case, back page 25, reach out and read. This is not books in doctor's offices. This is an incredible program that is, um, what they say, as, they says, as uh, Representative Cortese Batoon says, um, if you give us the books, we'll throw the doctors in for free. It's actually used in the medical visit. What they do is they take the book, with the, and this is a little, little kid, and there's all kinds of diagnostic things that you have, and when the parent um, walks out, they walk out with a book to increase literacy at home. Um, I was a little confused by the comments about concern about literacy-rich environments, that that would be a, a concern here at healthcare clinics. Are we expecting like phonics to be taught in doctor's offices to one-year-olds? This is a, a program that works in medical clinics and is working all over the country. It's been incredible research and it is de deserving of ongoing funding. So let's not mix it up with things that may be happening in grade school. We're talking about little kids. Um, it's a powerful program and it works really, really well. Moving back a bit to page, uh, if you're following back, page 17, everyone, if you're following along at home. There was concern referenced by a number of members. One question, uh, Representative Nadeau had a question on Friday night about the language at 17.21 and 17.25. He asked whether that language had changed coming out of committee. The answer of Representative Nadeau is that it did not. It passed the House, and then this is the same language that passed the House a month ago, or whenever that was. And members, what this does is it says that the current amounts that go out for early learning scholarships that you all love, right? You talk about early learning scholarships, you love it. The problem is that those scholarships don't actually meet the cost of care. So your family child care providers are not actually getting the full amount when they're caring for kids using scholarships. You want to make sure that they do. This thing adjusts based on what the actual cost of care is. And yes, it's going to be lower in some communities than others. That's how it works. It's going to be a little bit varied based on uh, the references that are made here. We want to make sure it does that. Far from hurting family child care, no, the point is to meet 100% of the cost. That may be different in different places, different, different settings. That's the idea. Do you want to like, keep it artificially low for everybody and we don't raise it because well, let's just make sure everybody suffers? That does not make any sense, my friends. The next paragraph, Representative Mueller is criticizing the idea that a program that has a four-star rating um, would, uh, would get uh, the, full co the cost of providing full-time care. This is our state's system for assessing quality, and I'll point out the folks who, who like early learning scholarships that you all are talking to, right? They want to push this as well to say that when we have a high quality care, we want to make sure that there is, in fact, we're meeting the full cost of that. Continuing backwards through the bill some more, my friends. Page 16, Representative Lesnikar had a criticism, and a number of others as well did, about the idea that scholarships go only to four-year-olds. Members, um, I heard a lot of points about supporting our family child care providers and could not agree more. 
This will make sure that those infant and toddlers that have a much higher cost receive funding to support that uh, as well. Far from undermining our family child care providers, this will actually boost our family child care providers as well. Uh, moving back to page three, I heard later Damoth criticizing the inclusion of the scholarships in the new Great Start Scholarship Program. Members, I hope you've noticed that this area is fragmented and messy and confusing. The Great Start Scholarship idea is to take these different fragmented programs and bring them together. Yes, that includes scholarships and is supported by those who are advancing scholarships as well. Do we want to leave a fragmented, messy program as we have? I do not think that we do. Um, and that gets us to just sort of the broadest point, I guess I'd say, and this is Representative uh, Hudson was really helpful in this. He talked about in the beginning of our committee, we heard that the families, uh, fam we asked the most of families at the time that they have the least. But you missed, Representative Hudson, the, the final part of that. We asked the most of families when they have the least and when it matters most. And how do we know it matters most? Because in fact, we also talked in our committee about the payoff. We talked about the fact that when you invest early, there's a payoff. Representative Hudson and others I've heard talk about the cost. We're investing money into this, and we have to remember we have to pay for it. I have a question. When a corporation is building a factory, does somebody say, well, but that's going to cost a lot of money? Yeah, it is. But they do the calculation. They say, guess what? We're going to have a big payoff. We build this factory. We're going to sell the products. We're going to have a big payoff, right? That is what we have found. That's what we know happens when it comes to young kids. We know there's, in fact, a payoff. When we don't make those investments, we see the, the cost all throughout the rest of life. Reverend Hudson, you said it's been the case throughout history that we ask the most of families when they have the least. The difference is maybe in the past you had all kinds of, um, uh, you had the village, you had the community coming together. There are so many families struggling on their own. They're struggling for rent. They're struggling for food. They're struggling to pay for the necessities. And we know that when we provide assistance when it comes to child care, first of all, so they can go pay for those things, but also high quality child care and high quality enriching experiences, that's a payoff that is as big as anything that we have. In fact, um, it's even bigger than many of the other things that we have. Members, um, if you choose to vote against this bill, it's important to recognize you are voting against $250 million in early learning scholarships in a form that the advocates of those scholarships think is phenomenal. Don't, don't be misled. It is phenomenal. It gets money into the hands of families with those littlest kids that is going to absolutely have a massive payoff. You're going to be voting against um, early childhood family education support staff. You're going to be voting against a statewide assessment. This is a proposal, Senator Duckworth in the Senate, Representative Clarity in the House, to make sure we know what's going on with kids when they enter kindergarten so we can measure it against what in the third grade. You want to know what our schools are doing in the early years? We've got to know what's happening in kindergarten. And all kinds of other good things that we've talked about. Members, um, I just have to say, um, Massive payoff when you make these investments. You know this while you support the scholarships. Now is the time to make those investments. There is no reason to vote against this bill. No reason at all. We are fully funding Metro Def Request. And we're, what we're gonna do in doing this is we're gonna get every kid in Minnesota off to the great start that they deserve. At least we're gonna put ourselves on the path to do so at a time when it makes the biggest difference. Members, let's come together. Let's vote green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 71 ayes and 61 nays, House File 2292 is repassed, is amended by conference, and its title agreed to.